ready. Okay. Mohammed, thank you for joining us. Um, what would you say the big issues have been at these talks so far? What should our viewers know back home? I think the talks have started on a very slow note. Uh, we want to see ambitious emissions reductions that are based on the multilateral rule-based system of the Kyoto system. And we will require parties here to adopt a second commitment period by way of amendment of the Annex B. And that hasn't advanced much, but we hear they are having a lot of consultations and bilaterals amongst between themselves and looks like they're working out on some text that hopefully may deliver something. But what we are also picking up is that a lot of the emissions reductions pledges that they've made that are quite low and will not be able to get the job done and that will not be able to get the world within safe global warming levels uh, may be locked up. And so if you look at the science and, and look at the impact, particularly across Africa, but also across a number of developing countries, we require to see ambitious emissions reductions now. And, and they're buying themselves time, uh, they're playing out the clock, and it's about time we actually call out for an ambitious outcome out of this process. The, next, the other thing is obviously the Green Climate Fund that has been set up. You can think of this as an account that has been opened. They haven't started negotiating the sources of the climate finance. We, start, we need to start seeing them starting doing that and start to actually delivering actual money to the fund beyond setting it up. And unless it's capitalized, we wouldn't be able to deliver the adaptations actions that are required, nor and also the mitigations actions. And you say that we need to start calling out the, the fact that this, this process isn't moving forward fast enough, but are activists in a different, difficult position here because the process is slow and there isn't an alternative. Do we have any, you know, what's the choice? If this is slow, what's the alternative? I will work it out this way. This is our process and the parties that are coming here are coming to negotiate for us and they're coming with positions, mandates that are given by our governments and it's these political leaders who are giving out this mandate that we need to shift. This is the only process where the least developed countries, the most vulnerable countries who've done the least to cause climate change, have a voice. It's these voices that we need to strengthen so that they're heard. They're already bearing the brunt of the changes. They're already being picked off by climate change. And we start need to deliver mitigation actions that are commensurate with what the science is calling for, but also a scale of financing that will be able to deliver their survival. And so, this is a stress. If you've seen the Occupy movement happening, it's about shifting you know, political leaders and for them to start delivering for the people. And it's that sort of mo momentum that we require here so that we can have pressure exerted on the political leaders so that they can deliver the most ambitious outcome. And one of the important issues you mentioned was the Green Climate Fund. Um, We've seen some developments yesterday. We had a committee report back on, on the development of the fund so far. What do you anticipate over the next week and a half? How will this move forward? We may end up with a fund. We don't want it to be an empty shell. We want the fund capitalized. And so our key message to the negotiators here is, yes, it's good to have a fund. And it's fine to have a fund, very well branded UN, UN uh, that is going to hopefully be under the COP governance. But we want the fund with money, and that's what the poor need, not just the fund. And so they need to go the next step. And here we have a possibility of that happening. And it's about them start delivering on those options that they have actually articulated quite well in their negotiation text. And where is this money going to come from for the fund? Uh, at varied sources, uh, primarily from public sources, but also from a number of innovative sources, including the bankers. It's such levies that you can actually be able to collect adequate money that will be able to help leverage more money from the private, but not in a way which you will have the private as the primary source of climate finance. You require public sources committed to be able to deliver things like adaptation uh, and to be able to deliver the energy, for example, for the poor, uh, largely again from uh, clean and sustainable sources. So this has been a, a point of contention here, whether this, this climate fund is filled with money from private sources or public sources. Why are campaigners so keen that it should be public money? I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one is the certainty that you will have with public sources, that it will be pro predictable. And you can be able to then use that money to be able to finance actions that the private sector will not be able to finance, particularly adaptation. 
And in the case of the private sector, particularly with some of the other innovative sources, you need them convinced, and you need them leveraged, and you need public sources helping do that. And so it's, 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 it's a mix of the, uh, both public and innovative sources, but the bulk of it has to be from public sources. And then with the public sources, we will be able to get ourselves in a stronger position to be able to deliver those actions. And you've been to a number of these conferences now. How do you think this one is playing out? The, how is the politics playing out here? How is the process going? Should we be optimistic about these talks? Are they slower than usual, faster than normal? What do you think? I think this is a moment of truth for the UN climate negotiations. Kyoto Protocol first commitment period is coming to an end. Uh, the multilateral emissions reduction system is up are there. We don't want to see a downward spiral. We want parties committing. And I want to be optimistic that beyond setting up institutions that we desperately need, they will be able to also deliver ambitious actions. And on that basis, who is stopping this from happening? We've heard a lot about Canada this week being a, a problem actor here. And who is really pushing this forward here? I must underline one thing, that these negotiations are based on a dialogue. It's a give and check. There will be compromises, there will be trade-offs. We don't want this to happen at the back of poor people's lives. There are countries that have been not been very progressive uh, and haven't engaged in good faith, and Canada is one such country. We have also Japan and Russia. We've indicated that they will not join, up, join a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. These parties are forgetting that they're legally bound to agree to a second commitment period. In the case of Canada, I think it's out to, to be able to stop a momentum that is building up to agree and deliver a second commitment period. If it wasn't that, they wouldn't be announcing a decision that they would be taking in a month's time. And, and all I can read in their, in their statement is just uh, they are wreck the negotiations, particularly for the second commitment period. In the case of the vulnerable countries, particularly the small island state, the LDCs, these are the most ambitious countries. These are the parties calling out for the most ambitious outcome. They want the environmental integrity secured. They want their survival and the survival of everyone on this planet secured. They have the least capacity to deal with it. And I'm sure if they had, we wouldn't be here. It's a shame that the, the imbalance of power between countries it, is playing out in a way that the countries that have bearing the greatest impact to climate change uh, are the ones that are mostly disempowered, particularly when it comes to the future climate regime. Okay, and as we approach the end of week one here, with a couple of days to go, how would you sum up this first week in, in, a, in, a, in a couple of lines? If I was going to use one word, I would say I'm still, I'm still optimistic. Uh, we've seen some considerable evolution. We've seen parties exchange and a number of conditions that have been spelled out, particularly by the EU, before this conference, uh, have been met. And those, that gives us now uh, the motivation to look out for something good at the end of next week. What we may need, perhaps, is to continue pushing on the margins, particularly for those parties that want to continue sitting on the fence and want to play out the clock and want to force on people, particularly the poor, a bad outcome. Mahmoud, thank you for joining us.